Hello and welcome everybody. It's so good to see you all here. Thank you for joining us today for our first Grouper Moon live stream of 2024. My name is Todd Bohannon. Um, I'm an educator from Seattle, Washington, and I've been working with Reef and the DOE on the Grouper Moon project for the past 13 years. Um, I feel very fortunate to be able to be here um, and participating in this wonderful statement. Okay, good. I'm glad you guys can hear me. Great. Um, and remember, use your chat. That's on the right-hand side of your screen. If you have anything to talk, you know, if you want to communicate with me throughout this, this live stream, that's a good place to do it. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm a teacher. Uh, I teach uh, in Seattle. As I said, I've been teaching for about 25 years. And um, for the last 13 years, I've been working with uh, DOE and Reef to create uh, lesson plans and education uh, acti educational activities for the Grouper Moon Project. <clears throat> and as you know, the Grouper Moon Project is an incredibly successful conservation project, and we're all really proud of it. Um, so enough about me. I have a bunch of people that I'm going to introduce to you today, um, a, a, a bunch of amazing scientists and researchers that are working on the project. Um, I'm going to have some some video clips that we're going to share from you of uh, the spawning that started the, last night. It's incredible. And then we'll have time for you guys to, to ask some questions towards the end. All right. So we're going to get started. I'm going to introduce you to, um, hold on, to Dr. Croy McCoy, who is the research manager and CIG lead on the project and Paul Chin, who's a research officer and works on multiple projects with the DOE, including um, the Grouper Moon Project. So I'm going to turn us over so that we, actually I'm gonna have you guys scooch over here and get real close. Okay, I'm gonna cut myself out so we can see you guys. So here, here we have Dr. Croy McCoy and Dr. Paul, er, and Paul Chin, research officer. Can you guys, maybe starting with, can you talk a little bit about how this project got started? Well, first of all, I attended Spot Bay Primary for you guys Ooh, that are Spot on there. <laughs> um, and a 29.29.5 year veteran of the DOE working on various science projects. And the lead, as Todd mentioned, group of German government. Um, the, journey with the Nassau Grouper started back in the 90s when I joined the DOE after college in Grand Cayman and back then they were still being fished and they were fished beyond the capacity that fishermen were actually coming and asking us what's going on and then back What do you in, mean they were fishing beyond capacity? What does that they mean? Were, the extraction rate was far beyond. So they were fishing, they were taking yeah. too many fish out? Exactly. Okay. And there was no, you know, season to take the groupers. So there was no regulation. No regulation whatsoever. And that led to the uh, grouper hole, as we call them, I mean, non-existent or unproductive, I guess you could call it. So not enough fish. Not enough fish. Yeah. Okay. Then in 2003, the two Cayman Brackers, um, Jimmy Robertson from Spot Bay and Jim Adam from the Water in Place area, discovered the aggregation on Little Cayman on the West End. And that's where the work source started because uh, one of the um, reef members, Ron Lil came in, we needed help to wrap heads around how we go about um, doing stock assessment, how much is there, and all that we needed to do. Why is it the important to know how, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Croy, okay. but why is it important to know how many fish are out there? Well, to manage any species of fish, you have to do the um, biology and the ecology of okay. the animal. And then the, it first starts with the stock assessment, we call it, where you, you get actual numbers of what's there and okay. how to manage it, really. So you need to know how many are there yeah. to help manage them. And that collaboration started back then and it's existed since. So we have a huge team of uh, brains, as I call it. Um, with, <laughs> you know, it, it takes a lot to get the work done and put everything together to develop a management plan that we are actually um, seeing the fruits of it now where, you know, out of season, you can actually go and, and catch an Osa grouper. And that took a lot of work and over a decade of work. 
And even over a decade, we did not see much returns on, um, you know, everything was slow in, in nature. You know, mm -hmm. so you don't wreck a system and expect it to bounce back overnight. Right. And so you can't fish all of them yeah. out, protect them for one year and expect all those fish to show back uh, to, to replenish themselves. It's going to take, how long did it take for them to start to replenish themselves after the, re the re regulations <clears throat> were put in place? We almost saw, it was almost a decade, but once it got going again, it just, you know, started seeing more fish showing up and right. stuff. So these systems are, has elasticity in it. What does that mean? I mean, uh, the ability to, to bounce back, you know, okay. but it takes a certain number of fish right. to, to build it to that. So the It seems like there's sort of a critical mass, or like it has yeah. to get to a certain number, and then you really start to see the numbers increase. Yeah, and I call the, uh, the um, fish spawning aggregation the uh, maternity wards of our ocean, because any mass spawners, we call them, that release eggs into the water column that go planktonic or oceanic for, for several weeks, like Nassau group or most fish, it being 35 in 42 days. And I always use the analogy that if you take the mothers going to the maternity ward, you're not going to have a population. Exactly. So that's the... Um, so the idea is to, to stop fishing while they're actually reproducing during yeah. that time of spawning so that they can spawn or punish themselves. But then other times a year, they can be fished with yeah. regulations. Yeah, and there's this uh, um, belief that the Nasa group came from different islands, Picklebank and all these other places. And we we had to um, prove that that was, if it was happening or it was not happening. And that took a couple of years. We tagged the fish, the acoustic tags it, and put hydrophones around, listen devices, what they are. And the you island. guys might remember that from watching the uh, Changing Seas documentary. There was, <clears throat> there was a section where they were catching and little, uh, Cats inside their bellies and then re-releasing them and then putting hydrophones which are like microphones under the water um and then and those were picking up those acoustic tags as they moved around the the, the island right yeah it um gave us movement told us where they lived um their home range because they're territorial normally throughout the year except for during spawning time so you know we we uh, actually understood what was going on in their world in a sense of um where they fed where did they go? Mm -hmm. Which lock, rock they lived under? Because these groupers actually, um, where they settle out as juveniles, they lived their entire lives there, except for during spawning. I mean, they forage, you know, to feed and stuff, but during spawning, then they go to the west end of the island, right? You know, to have their babies. And as if if any of you read um, the Grouper Moon book by Cindy Shaw or watched the documentary Changing Seas, you know that during, for most of the year. NASA are live by themselves. They don't hang out with other NASA. They're territorial. They have their one spot that they hang out at basically their whole lives. But then during this the full first full moon in the winter, all of them will get together at this, you know, at the grouper hole. Yeah. Right? Which is on the west end of Little Cayman. And thousands of them hang out for a few days during this spawning event. Yeah. And you know, when we after uh what everyone knows from the documentary that the uh, the population was fished down to about a thousand twelve hundred fish on the west end of uh, Little Cayman and that population has sensed with all the management plans in place of risen to you know eight ten thousand that we have right now and the BRAC was less than five hundred mm -hmm. and that's you know three or four thousand fish right now so we're on the we're we're headed in the right direction, if you want to put it that way, and hopefully it will continue. And uh, ten years from now, you yourselves will be out there seeing Nassau groupers. It's it's the largest known population in the whole region, and as Todd mentioned, it's one of the probably the uh, most successful fisheries management project in the region and also globally. Mm -hmm. So we can be proud of that. Every Camanian can be proud of that fact. Absolutely. I want to introduce um, Paul Chin, who's a, a research assistant, yeah? yeah? A research officer. Research officer, yeah. thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about what your role is at DOE? Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Paul uh, Chin. Uh, I work with the Department of Environment, and um, I've been there for 15 years, uh, and I have the privilege of uh, saying that I've been a part of the Group of Moon Project for about 13 years. 
So uh, I've been on the program for a while, but uh, before that, I was actually sitting in the same seats that you guys are sitting in a few years ago. <laughs> so um, if you if this is a route that you guys are looking to take, it, by all means, it's um, it's not an easy route. But uh, how did you get that, there? Like, what, well, what's how did it start? Believe it or not, I wasn't originally um, slated to be a scientist. I was um, I wanted to be an engineer, a mechanical engineer, and um, it it took a, a life changing moment for me while I was on a dive doing some. Um, some volunteer work for the World Wildlife Federation, where I saw um, a pregnant seahorse, and after doing some re some research, I found that the uh, pregnant seahorse is actually male, and the males carry the babies. And that, exactly, so <laughs> so um, so that was a, a life changing moment for me, and it's almost like a light bulb went off, and uh, almost uh, immediately changed my degree, and I've been doing marine biology ever since, and I'm I'm thankful for where I'm at. So, um, being with the department, um, I've been under uh, Croy's um, supervision the entire time, and he's uh, guided me and helped me to where I'm, I'm at today and I'm very thankful for that. So if we have some year four students out there that are thinking, I, I want to do that, that's mm -hmm. what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Is there any advice you could give to them or things that they should be thinking well, about? <clears throat> my journey with that, I uh, started diving in the BRAC in Little Cayman um, very young. Mm -hmm. I started at nine and it's it's the only job I've really had is um, ocean sciences. So the curiosity I've been learn more and, and stuff, and that eventually turned into uh, headed off to university to study marine biology. And then even, you know, once I got, you know, comfortable with that whole arena, it's all I ever knew, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to further my education, so I kept going, you know, did my master's in marine biology, and then my, you know, my doctorate degree in marine biology also. Yeah. So how much school did you actually go to to become, to be where you, where you are now, your roles in, in DOE? Well, I, uh, I spent four years, 91 to 95, at University of Tampa. Uh -huh. And then I did my master's in University of Wales, in Bangor, North Wales. Okay. Oh, wow. And then I continued with my PhD there to do my doctorate degree at Bangor University. The former, it was, it was called University of Wales, and it became an independent university. It was a satellite, satellite of the main university in, um, in Wales. Okay. They have several campuses. I see. So my, my journey started out, um, I was in high school uh, in Grand Cayman, so I was at John Gray High School. Woo, John Gray! <laughs> John Gray, so um, we don't have any on here, but uh, um, private, um, prior to that, I was at uh, Red Bay Primary. I don't know if you have any Red Bay Primary on board, but uh, that's where I went. And then um, I went out to a junior college in Hong Kong where I spent two years. And then I did a five-year program in uh, University of Essex where I obtained a bachelor's and a master's in, uh, in marine biology. Amazing. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit, what does the day look like for a scientist, a research officer on the Grouper Moon project? What, 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 how does it start? What, what are you doing? Well, it starts on the night before <laughs> <laughs> organizing everything because... Uh, you know, the day starts at eight o'clock yeah. on the boat. So, yeah. so eight o'clock in the morning, you guys are on the on boat. On the water, yeah. And I'm how many of you are out there on that boat? Usually, uh, at least twelve. Okay. Twelve to fourteen plus crew. And, and you take the boat out to the to the aggregation yep. site, the, the grouper hole, and then what do you do? Well, we have different people assigned different tasks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some are we we have this. Uh, we're using AI now to um, actually recognize fish, so we um, take GoPros. And we take in video and pictures. So you guys, pictures. I'm sorry to interrupt you. The AI that Croy is talking about is essentially the same that you have on your cell phones. That you hold up your phone, it sees your face, and it unlocks your phone. Right. That's this. It's essentially the same type of programming that they're using to create um, a, like a fish Facebook, a, a, a yeah. database of all of the fish faces because they're all unique. Right. Like okay. a like a fingerprint. Right. So each fish has a specific uh, pattern. And uh, the AI engine recognizes those patterns, and then they try to match up um, the patterns with, from previous pictures or other pictures that have been uploaded to the program. Now, what would happen if you were looking at the fish, you know, you saw a fish one year, and then you saw it again four years later, is it still gonna look the same? Yeah, the, the uh, patterns is what the AI picks up. And the um, patterns stay the same. Yeah, it's just the same as how we ourselves, mm -hmm. our faces, you know, human beings, you know, we recognize a face. Right. And it don't change much. It's yeah. the same thing with an also grouper. Yeah. So in the future this year and next year, 10 years from now, the patterns will show up and it will tell you that's the same fish. 
That's amazing. It is, yeah. So, okay, so you're taking, you're doing fish faces. Um, what else are you doing out there? We're doing stereo video. Paul can talk about so that. So stereo video. Paul, can you talk a little bit about what stereo so video stereo is? Stereo video, we have a, a contraption. It's, it's collapsible. It was actually designed by the um, some of the team, on the some of the reef team. It's collapsible. So it's, um, it's kind of like how your face works. We have two eyes, which eventually comes together to make one photo, one, one, one image. picture, one yeah. image, exactly. So we have two GoPros mounted slightly at an angle, so that way it captures the the fish from two different angles and creates one image. And that allows us, here we go. So here, as I mentioned before, it's collapsible. Once you take this um, this pin out here, it can fold in half. And on either end, you have the GoPro. GoPro. The GoPro here and the GoPro here. And those, even though it looks like Straight, they're slightly angled towards each other and that will allow us to capture the the fish into one image and that allows us to be able to measure the fish as well so this is a very very um intelligent piece of uh con contra um uh, piece so, of equipment yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, I can, exactly i can remember the first one we built <laughs> using that um actually at hato bay in the workshop there we uh Took a base with a one of the old high eight cameras, actually. High eight, yeah, yeah. 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 like a cassette, Wait. guys. Some yeah. of you kids probably won't know. What yeah, they is. don't know. They don't know what a video yeah. cassette is. <laughs> we had we, had, we put two lasers into it, and we that's one of the times we figured out that fish don't like the green light because the minute you shine a green light, they will take off, but the red they don't pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And we could adjust it that we were adjusting at twenty five centimeters. So these two two little dots, if you set them at twenty five centimeters you know 25 feet away and you adjust it it doesn't matter how far away it is it's still going to be 25 meters they're away. parallel guys yeah. you remember that from math parallel right yeah. two lines that go straight and never cross and what we used to do is take video and uh, once you know that you put that on fish side on and you know between those two dots on that fish is uh 25 centimeters you can extrapolate and see the full length of the fish and that's how we were doing size classes so you're measuring yeah. them using la lasers you yeah. using yeah. lasers yeah. that were parallel right. and taking a picture of the side of the fish right. and then you could then from that figure right. out exactly how right. big the fish is then we graduated into this guy here that made right. life a lot easier right. now, <laughs> why is it important for us to know the size of all these fish what why is that part of the data that you're interested in? well it serves many purposes but the main one is to see how healthy the population is in, in terms of are we getting what we call recruitment, which is the uh, teenagers coming in to or join the kids or young kids join the so the new young, the new yeah. young ones coming in or the okay. big mature ones. Yeah. And so the older they are, obviously, the, the bigger they are, are. Exactly. Right. And this, the younger they are, the smaller. So that's going to tell you age. Exactly. Right. Yeah, essentially. Yes. Okay. You know, we, we know they they um, recruit to the aggregation to participate around six or seven years, I right. think. Mm -hmm. you know with them with that and it also tells us if, if we measure enough we get some we get an average you know size of the fish on the aggregation but if we see the population average size starts to move back smaller right that's telling us that there's more coming in there's the, more young ones, ones yeah, coming, coming in, in right and so we want to see more, more of yes. the smaller ones yeah, exactly, out there exactly. and is that what you're seeing are you that's exactly what we're seeing wow you know it took about 10 years, 10 years. for us to start to see that um pattern show up in the population which is great and really that was a a very um i guess you'd call it aha moment uh -huh. yeah. what we're doing is working you right. know so you know that's very positive news when we saw that awesome it, it took over a decade as i mentioned earlier yeah so. a long time yeah you guys uh dr mccoy uh paul thank you so much for being here it's a um, pleasure uh, and you guys thank them for being here give them a Thanks, guys. All right, we're gonna and now you can go to Spot Bay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and now I'm gonna introduce to you guys another scientist working on the project. So you guys can hop off there. Pancakes and eggs away. All right. So here we have Dr. Christy Pattengill. Mm -hmm. Hi, hi everybody. And so can you tell us what your role is on the Grouper Moon project? Absolutely, yeah. So I'm one of the directors at Reef, at Reef Environmental Education Foundation. And so I have been part of the project since the early days um, and help um, in collaboration with some of the other lead scientists and Dr. McCoy and the others from um, the DOE in helping kind of plan holistically what the objectives of the science 
um, what we want to try and get done in each field season, but also trying to collect, you know, coordinate with the education and outreach. So the objective broadly. on any science project, mm -hmm. the objective is critical and to understand that. So what is the objective? Yeah. Why are I mean, we up here? General, the overarching plan is how what's happening, spawning aggregation on all of the Cayman Islands. Uh, we focus a lot of our work on, on this one on Little Cayman, but we also um, do several um, trips over to Cayman Brac, and we've worked previously on, on Grand Cayman to help better understand what is happening each year change over time. As um, Paul and Croy were saying, it's been really great to have those aha moments mm -hmm. of you know, the seeing the protections that the Cayman government has put in place to fight, to pay off and see that population grow. And so we're doing that through a lot of different ways. We do it, you know, high tech, like with the, the stereo video camera that Paul was talking about to just as low tech as looking and watching, documenting behavior mm -hmm. and kind of everything in between. We use a lot of tools in the toolbox and and try and just stay, you know, make sure we're we're keeping track of all the bits right mm -hmm. okay so um what you work for reef mm -hmm. and what is your role so i'm a director at reef and i uh, work on a lot of the science the conservation science our director of conservation science dr ali condelmo is also part of the project and we collaboratively um, bring the um, work in collaboration with the doe on grouper moon we're the the two primary partners, and then we have our scientists from Scripps Oceanography and Oregon State and other other partners as well to make it really a collaborative project. It really couldn't happen without all of yeah. the players. Yeah, it's it, a whole village mm -hmm. to, to bring this this project together. Now, you recently received an award what, for a, a pretty prestigious award. What oh, was that? Uh, yes, I was inducted into the Women's Diver Hall of Fame. Yeah. That's amazing. What yeah. what what does that mean? Uh, like, well, what that, did you have to do? Yeah, it's it's really a big honor. There's um, just a couple hundred women in in the hall, and it was started um, to really recognize pioneers um, in the field of diving across a broad spectrum. So for me, Me, my overarching conservation. All right, we're back. <laughs> um, the so my role as um, as part of that's been I've been with Reef um, over twenty years, and so my contribution and the reason that I was inducted was through my contributions to through Reef's conservation work, and the the Grouper Moon Project is one of those one of those parts but there's also the the hall also recognizes you know the women in the military and in uh, diving medicine and technical diving so in training mm -hmm. you know bringing in um, women young girls into the sport of scuba diving amazing i wonder which of these students is also going to be inducted to the women's diving hall of fame mm -hmm. i'm sure we've got there's at some, least one out there I bet. Um, so we have some footage that I wanted to share that was mm -hmm. shot last night, uh, but I want to in introduce it first. So you guys know from, from watching the documentary and doing any of the activities that you've done that these grouper, you know, they spend all year alone on their, on their little home reef site. And then on this first full moon, they come together to spawn and we're, we're out there counting and waiting for that mm -hmm. spawning to happen. And when it does happen. Well, has it happened yet? Yes, yes. So we've had spawning uh, for the last two nights. Wow. The first two nights ago was just a little starter, and then last night it was it was quite a lot. Okay, so I'm going to share a clip with you guys so that you can see. I'm actually going to share a couple of clips with you to so you can see what the spawning looks like.
Yes. So sorry. Okay. We yes. were muted. So we're back. I, I'll tell you a little bit about what you just saw. So, so that they only spawn right at dusk, right when it, the sun is setting. So during the day, they do a lot of resting. They do a lot, visiting cleaning stations, and What's a lot a cleaning of station? cleaning station is is kind of like a car wash for fish. They're actually in known spots, kind of like yep. your car wash might be on the corner um, down the street. There are usually set up in sponges or, or a little outcropping, and there are cleaner animals, little fish mostly, and some shrimps mm -hmm. that that's their, and wrasse, that's their role is to come and they pick parasites and uh, dead skin and they just kind of clean the fish up. And um, fish use those cleaning stations often th uh, regularly, but at the at the spawning site, they're really important because the fish are spending a lot of energy in the act in being there and you know they're all bunched up they're yeah. in a big tight group so it's really important for those spawning aggregations to have a lot of cleaning stations so there's a lot of cleaning that happens during the day and so you guys yeah. i will post a video of the cleaning stations on the blog today so i encourage you all to go to the group Moon education blog um, either at home or in your classroom and you can see the videos uh, there of the cleaning stations yeah yeah okay so that's a so that's a really you know on all coral reefs but in in um the spawning aggregation for sure so a lot of during the day is is that and then as it approaches the evening on the nights when they're going to spawn they all end up taking on that black and white we call it their tuxedos because they get all fancy they they turn they on the black color. and white yeah they and that that's males and females both will take on this black and white um so that's kind of when you know that spawning is going to happen at any time because they all turn black and white Whereas before, they some were dark, some were light, some were li regular color. Why now do they black do and white. We think it's kind of a behavioral cue. Like, okay, now it's, it's a communication. It's the time. Yes. They're communicating through changing mm -hmm. their color. Yes. Is yes. that common among fish? Uh, yes. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I, in nature, there's a lot of different ways that um, animals can communicate with visual cues. Right. And, and um, color pattern is, is definitely one of them. Those fish are not going to use those colors when they're on the reef normally. They're going to be in their regular barred color. Okay. Um, but yeah, that, and then a couple, the females, when they're ready to spawn, they'll turn all black and they'll start to rise up and a bunch of the males will follow after the black and white ones. So what you saw there in that video was a, a, a female going up and usually they just they kind of go up in bursts and that burst you know there was maybe 30 fish in that one sometimes there'll be three or four or five sometimes there's 50 or 60 fish it's and once kind of you get down there and some will go and then all it's everybody's going all at once so the us as scientists mostly our job is to just sit back and watch we don't want to interfere too much we're going to interact mostly by watching and and filming from the side but we do have a, a couple scientists who are in amongst the fish to collect um, better image data so that we can get better images to better understand kind of individual behaviors, but also to share with the public and with all you students out there. So we're going to show another clip of, and I'm actually going to re-show the one that we showed before because I think it, it froze for some of you. So let's, let's try again and, and see if the internet's going to uh, be our friend. This is the second clip. This was also taken just last night, you guys. All right. So, so what what were they doing there when they were swirling yeah, around like they, that? Yeah, I I don't know quite why they do that, but I think it looks it's just like a dance. Kind of, yeah, they just are kind of swirling up probably kind of as they're swimming up it's you know easier than just going straight up probably right. to keep them kind of lower 
um, but still staying all together in a group as they go up. Um, and so when they're doing that, that's when they're releasing their gametes. Yes. And that, yeah. and the spawning they're releasing is happening. the gametes, and then that the the in mid water, then those little babies are going to float off into the currents and be part of the currents for about uh, 45 days, actually. So how big are the babies? Well, the little eggs are, are almost microscopic. You can see them. Sometimes you can catch in your light. You can kind of see them. Maybe later we could... I'll, I'll post some pictures yeah. of them on the on the blog for you guys to mm -hmm. see. Um, and then pretty quickly, they'll, they, you know, hatch and they just, the little tiny, they're tiny little guys yeah and then they just are float around as plankton basically for 30 to 45 days now how do they don't don't they just all get eaten if they're just floating around well there's that's why so many are are spawned so that hopefully most of them do get eaten or or just drift away but enough of them get caught in currents and eddies we know from some of our drifter studies maybe you can share some of the drifter maps later mm -hmm. that show that the water when on the nights when they're spawning the water kind of does these little fun little currents of eddies that keep the babies close to the island so that you guys might remember that from the documentary off. yeah right? so they stay pretty close to the island and then eventually are kind of they drift out a little and the, the currents bring them back to the islands by the time 30 to 45 days when they're ready to to settle what settling means they come out of the plankton and they actually join the reef they'll come down into the seagrass and the mangroves and the little rocky reefs that are in shallow water and that's where they'll spend then a couple of years kind of hiding out and getting big enough so they can go out on the reef all right i have one more video clip that i want to share with you guys that gives you kind of a, an idea of how, just how many fish are out there because uh, it, it's pretty incredible You can see some of the researchers there out there counting and collecting data. And there's the fish. Now, how big are those fish? I mean, to see it on the screen is one thing, but to experience yeah. it in real life is, is very Some different. Some of the really big ones, you know, can be... There you go. <laughs> uh, they can be really big. Oh, uh, what, three feet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the little babies, they come to the site when they're about that big, like the teenagers. Yeah. That and so how heavy, like, what would one of those big, big moms I don't weigh? Know. What's a big mom? What's a big fish? Big Nassau? 30 pounds. 30 pounds. 30 pounds. 30 okay. Pounds, yeah. Between 20 and 30. I mean, they're big. Yeah. They're big fish. They are big fish. Wonderful. Um, oh, so we have a question here um, uh, from one of the classrooms is, where was this video taken? Yeah, so that is taken at the spawning aggregation on the west end of Little Cayman. Um, so just right offshore, not far from here, um, straight out kind of where the island, the edge of the reef kind of comes to a point. Mm -hmm. That's generally where spawning aggregations are found. So on Cayman Brack, it's on the east end, same thing, out at the end of the, where the, the island ends, out on the east end is where the aggregations usually are. And we think that's because it's easier to find, mm -hmm. kind of like your corner store, your mm -hmm. corner market, you know, it's, it's on the corner. So it's easier to find, right? That's why we think and it's also for currents and distribution um, to be able to, that's why we think aggregations are on edges of islands, I not see. in the middle. And so it's it's not just the NASA that will use those those spots. Yeah, other, that's right. other species will. Yeah, these are really special places, and that's why they're really important to protect because it's not just NASA grouper. We've seen over twenty five different species of grouper and snapper, and um, 
the jacks all use these special places as their nurse as their reproduction grounds so they're really important places for not just nassau grouper a lot Wonderful. of other grouper species right now are out there spawning as well okay yeah christy yeah. thank you so much Absolutely. for being here thanks guys. all right and, and um can you grab janelle yes okay um we're gonna we're gonna bring in a uh, graduate student that is gonna come and and share with us about some of the research work that she's doing. Um, while we're waiting for her, I'm gonna show that video again because I think it's amazing. All right, so I have with me Janelle. Would you tell us a little bit about what you do here on this project and who you are? <laughs> yeah, so I'm Janelle. I am one of the graduate students in Scott Hippel's lab, which I don't think. We've not met Scott Hippel, but he's one of the researchers here from Oregon State University. Right, and for my graduate work, I look at the impacts of climate change, mainly increasing temperature on the development and early life history stages of um, Nassau grouper and a re more recently also tiger grouper. Um, and so at early life history stages, it's when the fish are spawning and they start to form these fertilized eggs that turn into little baby grouper right. or larvae. Okay. So you're specifically looking at how climate change is impacting the aggregation. How, yeah. how, are, how do you study that? What are you doing? So in past years, a lot of the divers would um, physically collect the eggs that um, are coming out. In so they'll go that you've seen. during that spawning. So you saw those spawning bursts in the clips that I sent you. When those happen, several of the, the researchers will have Ziploc baggies. That's our fancy scientific tool. And they'll swim through it and they'll collect s samples of the eggs. Yep. Now, is that going to impact the population by taking the, that sample? No, so each female produces millions of eggs in her life. So the and very there's small, thousands of females. Yeah, so it's a very small portion of eggs that we take back. And most likely not all of those millions actually survive sure. in the real world. A very, very small, actually less than, less than 1% actually right. make it. So the amount of eggs we're taking really don't um, affect the population at all. Really. And so what do you do with those eggs? So we bring them on the boat, bring them back to the lab, and I have bins that I will... ...for about a week. So we raise these eggs... Oh, oh we, just... just, we dropped out, but I think we're back now. Okay. Okay. So we'll raise these eggs in four different temperature treatments. Um, the first two are current variability. and What the, does that mean, current variability? Um, it's what we would expect. So the first temperature is 25 Celsius. So why are you testing temperature? Why is that important? So we can see climate impacts, essentially. So, so the, as, a, as the ocean warms, which it is doing, yeah. we're, we're, you're seeing how that impacts the eggs? Yes how it impacts their development and their survival rates. Okay. So are all the eggs gonna survive at 31 degrees Celsius compared to 25 degrees Celsius type of thing. And what is the temperature out there now? Right now it's about 27, like 27.2 I think is around a typical temperature. Um, in the past 20 years, it's been as low as 25, um, but now we're seeing closer to 27. And so it has gone up since yeah. the beginning of this project. And in the future, we're expecting it to go even higher to 29 and then eventually 31 degrees Celsius. And what is the impact of that increasing temperature? Like when you, when you, so I'm assuming you have some of them in a tank that has 29 degree water. And what happens to those eggs as compared to the 27 degree or the 25 degree eggs? So survival rates are going down. So we're seeing increased mortality and death in the So eggs, more die as the temperature goes up. Right. Um, but not all of them die. Some do really well, some survive for a few extra days, and some don't. And we think potentially there's a um, maternal input. So the moms are, some moms are producing eggs that do better than others. So some, right. So there, so it, some eggs are able to survive and some are not. And, and right. certain moms are producing those eggs that survive and some moms are producing those that do not. Exactly. Okay. And so the idea is that knowing this, we want the population to be as big as possible. Um, so those genes that those moms have, those really good genes that can handle 
climate change and increasing temperature keep getting passed on. And so the population has its best fighting chance of surviving increasing temperatures. So the bigger the aggregation, the higher the chance that that aggregation will survive increasing temperatures. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. So, Which is amazing for us here on, on Little Cayman where we have, you know, maybe 10,000 fish now and, and, and growing pretty fast. Right. 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 So all of the work that Group Moon Project is not only helping right now, but even in the future, the next 50, 100 years, we're hoping that, you know, the work pays off. And so can you tell us maybe some of the students out there might be interested in doing what you're doing? What was your pathway to to get here? What, what did you when did you start to think that this was what you wanted to do and how did you do it? Yeah. So um, as a kid, I loved the environment, the ocean, et cetera, but I didn't know this was a real career. I thought it was just something people did for fun. I had no <laughs> idea I could do this. And so going to college, I actually studied biology on a pre-med track where I thought I was going to be a What does pre-med mean? Um, pre-medical, where you become a doctor, a okay. medical doctor. Okay. And so that's what I thought I was going to do. I knew I liked science, but I didn't know what type of jobs were sure. out there. And while in college, I found another department at our school called Marine and Environmental Science. And I took just one class and elective in that department and realized I really like this stuff and you can actually study it for a living. And I realized they're professors and researchers yeah. and all these people doing that type of work. And so I changed my major like the next semester, um, realizing it was possible. Mm -hmm. And I figured I'd try it until maybe it wasn't fun or I, it just didn't work out. Um, yeah, just see how it goes. Yeah. And Great. it worked out. I got an internship in undergrad that allowed me to study in, um, Maria, French Polynesia. And French Polynesia. Yeah. And what were you doing there? Um, I did a lot of um, algae work, actually. Really? A lot of, yeah, looking at algal traits. Um, what, what are we looking at algae for? Um, because a lot of the reefs everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, not just in Maria, are getting broken by algae. Right. Corals and so the algae there. actually will grow on the coral and kill the coral. Um, not necessarily, it's just out competing. So it's oh, a it's lot of the resources with, that corals I need to, yeah. And so the... Um, like taking the nutrients that they might need yeah, to grow. Yeah. I see. And so... That was so a how did you project. study that? What were you doing? Were um, you out in the water, like collecting yeah, algae? Yeah, so we were collecting algae, measuring a bunch of... So traditionally, algae is um, categorized into um, different groups that aren't always the most useful, so. Okay, one second, uh, I'm gonna introduce you. CIS has to leave really quick, and I just wanna answer your question. Um, CIS's question from um, Axel and Agnes, they'd like to know, um, how do the grouper know when to spawn, and how do they know it's the full moon? And I'm gonna bring in Dr. Yeah, Croy McCoy to come in and help us answer that question. <clears throat> Croy, could you join us? A moment. Thank you so much. There we go. Okay, and we're back. So the question was, how do they know it's the full moon? How do they know where to go? Well, for one, you start with full moon. Okay. Stop me still trying to understand, but we know the moon phases influence animal behavior. You know, whether it's in the ocean or whether it's in a right. above. In and the, the moon actually affects yeah. the currents. It right? affects the currents and. They cue in on these factors mm -hmm. that leads them to to try and nail down it. how they do it. We're mm -hmm. still trying to figure that one right. out. But we know there's certain cues with currents, with uh, moonlight, there's um, so tides. Even, even with being out here 20 years and studying this, there's, there's still a lot we don't know, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. You know, we, we're still, you know, plodding on, trying to figure this all out herself, but Mother Nature, these animals have been doing this, this for millions of years. Yeah, way before and we got way here. Way before we got here, and they just um, continues on. It's like sort of, you could you could almost parallel it with how birds find their way around from, sure. you know, flying through, stopping off here to feed, and then going on to South America. Yeah. You know, it's a phenomenon that uh, developed over yeah. millions of years of yeah. how they do that. And the uh, how they know where they are, uh, where to go? Where to go? Um, through the tracking that we did before with these animals, we know a male actually 
will leave the aggregation, the, a mature male, mm -hmm. and go around carousing other teenagers, if you want to call them that, they have no idea where to go. Yeah, they're like, and, hey, follow me. Yeah, and it's called the migration when you see like 10, 20 of them coming along the edge of the shelf. So they're migrating. They're migrating back to the, to, to the uh, aggregation. So, the, so the, the olders, the adults are literally like teaching the younger teaching what it. to do. Yeah, and it just gets, um, continues that process uh, in the population over and over. So it just it makes it work because the, the males are teaching, as you say, the, the teenagers, if yeah. you want to call them that, where the site is. And we've, we've even had data where showing us that some of these males would even go to the old group of hole at the east end of Low Cayman and hang on there and, and realize that there's no nothing happening. Nothing happening. They'll go right back to the west end. So and sometimes I think when when we were when you had the acoustic trackers and or which I think are still there, that weren't we seeing some of the fish would, would actually swim around the island multiple times before they yeah, would find they, the spot? They was totally um but we think that was actually again, you know, doing the migra migration of okay. them. So they were actually, so yeah. at that time they're trying to get more to come around. Yeah, and you know there's a lot of courtship behavior that goes on. What too. does that mean, courtship behavior? Meaning, uh, the males will like nudge the pregnant females and right. Know, so certain behaviors that are showing it's it's yeah. time for us to spawn. Yeah, it's um just that behavior that they they uh exhibit. It just seems the color pattern. Yeah. You know, they're right. That you know you're ready to spawn and right. stuff. The female goes fully black, and you know the males they go bicolor and, and such that her cues again letting each other know when the spawn happens. Awesome. And it's it's the uh, one of the most amazing things I think the, the eggs will hydrate, meaning they they um, they collect water, they fill yeah, with water overnight. I mean you know they're pregnant because the, the belly is not as big, and then you go back the next day and the belly is huge. They're ready to spawn, and that means it's about yeah. to happen. Yeah, there, there's other cues too, and uh, even like they, we call it, the local name is Heron, is Scad. You know, these guys show up because they, they pluck the, um, they're like plankton feeders, they uh -huh. pluck the eggs out of the water. Right. So whenever you see those show up, and how they know so, so they're they're tonight. knowing even before you guys when yeah. they show up that's your cue you're like and that's okay. one of the cues yeah here is a school of them coming along and you know it's going to be spawned that night right and that's something again that has been you know developed over thousands and millions of years nature's and, amazing yeah and other other fish cue in on that also and even the uh we call it ocean yellowtails you know the I think it's the Blue Runner. Okay. They show up too. Yeah. And, yeah. and the sharks show up, you know, because they, they want supper also. They want to know about the sharks. Are you seeing sharks out there? Yeah. And why, what are the, I mean, has that changed over where, when you first started and there was 1,200 fish out there and now, you know, 10,000, has there been an increase in sharks? And what are they yeah, doing when they're presence, out there? Um, you know, they, sharks look for opportunities and a lot of time, I mean, it, it's a sign of a healthy ecosystem. So when we want to see sharks. Exactly. Why is that and so important to have these upper level predators? Well, for one, they, they, uh, it's part of how the system works and Mother Nature works. And keeps that balance. Keeps that balance. Mm -hmm. You know, they're apex predators. Right. And I recall a couple of years ago, it was over a dozen of them, mm -hmm. you know, trying to get a... a pick off some of those pick fish. Off some of, there's some there with pieces, bits of yeah. the sand. <laughs> yeah, we've we've awesome. seen some Nassau that have big chunks out of them, like Lucky, and and they're tough, man. Yeah, some of them survive fish, that, yeah. and they still participate in the spawning right. year after year. Right, with half of their toughness, and as long as it's not the spine, they yeah. can still swim with any any of their organs. But uh, it's it's very interesting with sharks because it's almost like the sharks wait for them to get distracted spawning because it's a lot of effort to get. Um, to nail a Nassau grouper because they're fast. I mean, they, yeah, they're gone. But when they're distracted, when they're spawning, yeah. that's the that's the opportunistic that's, yeah. moment for those sharks and to sharks dive know in. You know, they're not paying attention yeah. and they just go in and take one like that. So. And do you think does that have any impact on the the population, or is that N no? I don't. No. You know, it's just you know Mother Nature doing its thing and that balance in there of uh, you know sharks are the uh, I guess you call it the cleaners of our ocean. Right. right. Our ocean would not be uh, healthy mm -hmm. without sharks. That's why they're so important in this ecosystem. That and they're they're there. picking off the weak and the sick and keeping exactly. and the healthy ones survive. And that's what keeps a healthy population, right? 
And yeah. so seeing more sharks actually is an indication of a healthy reef. Exactly. Okay. That's amazing. Yeah. We have one more question. The question is, is it hard to maintain the population of groupers? Great question, you guys. Well, throughout our work, we know we are predominantly self-recruiting, meaning, you know, our babies off the West End are all coming from here. Are coming from here. Right. And our drifter work with the larval that, uh, that we talked, yeah. mentioned, and we know they're, you know, it's from the old Cayman, this exchange going on for Cayman Brack. And, and you've done genetic studies too yeah. of, of what's out there to make, to, sh to prove that, oh, these eggs are coming from these moms that are from here on Little Cayman. Yeah, and you know, the, the sheer fact that, uh, you know, I suspected this many a long time ago that uh, the, uh, we are predominantly um, self recruiting because it, it was mentioned in the, in the uh, in these small oceanic islands, you know, you have to maintain, we call it a standard stock, which is your population, mm -hmm. and don't depend on upstream to, to do that. And one of the, maybe that's why it took 10 years for us to start see the population, you know, go back up. Right. And the, uh, the sheer fact that uh, how Mother Nature works is mainly it um, self-sustains itself so it, it's, it, it's only every 10, 15 years that you see that, we call it a pulse of upstream eggs that, you know, shift in the oceanic currents. Okay. Come this way. And our drifter work tells us that. Because a lot of the drifters we, we release will start those eddies that Christy was talking about. Mm -hmm. And they loop. But and they're coming right back to the, the, the islands. Exactly. And you, you guys might remember from the documentary, the Changing Seas documentary, that these drifters, they're like a big sock. That, yeah. that uh, has a GPS phone at the top that can send a signal to the satellite and they'll put those drifters in the water on the nights that they spawn and those drifters will follow the spawn with the current. Right? Yeah, you, you release them right into the spawn. You know, they, it's a big sock, maybe uh, two feet across mm -hmm. and, you know, 10 feet long. Right. And it's, ha it's at 25 feet, so it's not affected by winds or wave action. So it's just the current just that's the currents, really driving and, it. You know, it's the strangest thing to see it move against the waves, against the currents, you know, because a lot of them will take off and head towards Jamaica, yeah. looping. You're like, oh, whale back. shark caught that. It's taking it that way. <laughs> no, that's the current. Yeah, it's the current. They follow the currents. That's amazing. And we've done even work since then with um, that uh, week-long following the drifters right. and collecting the eggs to... Yeah. The, to ground truth and be sure that what we were doing was correct. Right. <laughs> yes, it was. It's correct. taken a long time to yep. get all of that data. They're using an underwater microscope. Right. Uh, okay. So guys, we have time for some questions. We've, we've had a couple in the chat. I thank you guys so much for it. If you guys have some questions that you'd like to, to ask, um, you can unmute yourself and you can ask those questions or your teacher can put them into uh, the chat and I can read them out for us. And I just want to, while we're waiting for you guys, let's see here. Does Miss Gail's class have a question? Hi there, we see you. Hello. I think she's speaking. Oh, but we can't hear you. We just see you. We don't hear you. So, so maybe you could type in your question into the into the chat. It's so good to see you guys. I'm so happy to see everyone showing up today. Oh, it looks like we lost them. All right, so um, let's go back just a second. I wanna wrap up with, with you, with Janelle. So Janelle has been studying the, the different temperatures and how those impact the eggs. And, right. and we see that the bigger the population of Nassau that we have, the better chances they're gonna have of surviving climate impacts the a warming ocean um what is there anything else that that you're learning from your research about the impacts that climate is having on on nasa um well um you already know this but nasa grouper is a critically endangered species so I wouldn't, climate wasn't the first thing we were looking at when trying to understand the population how to help it grow and that type of thing so a lot of this work is 
um, more recent. Um, it was more so trying to figure out how the population can get bigger and larger um, after a lot of the overfishing and overharvest of the species. And so looking at climate now is um, just a whole nother world that we're just getting into and understanding its impacts. And right. so I'm really excited to get even more info out of that. Oh, it looks like Miss Gales. Okay, Miss Gales class is back. On TV. Well, TV, you're on the live stream with us. Okay, so keep going. Um, let's see. So um, there aren't that many answers right now. That we're still figuring it out. We're still learning more and more um, every day. And so, so that's that's great information for you guys because we're going to need some of you to become scientists and, and join Janelle and the rest of the DOE and Grouper Moon team to study how you know how we can um, help protect the 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 reef from um, climate change and the and a warming ocean. Now, if anyone has a question and they want to type it into the chat, now is the great now is a great time to do that. We have just about two more minutes before we're going to go. Okay, so Miss Gale says approximately how many grouper are in the Cayman Islands now? Well, let's. I'm going to bring I'm going to bring Dr. Croy McCoy back over here really quick, who's going to answer that question for you. Excellent the, question. The numbers we are getting that. You know, we haven't fully assessed this year, but we know from last year it's between eight and ten thousand mm -hmm. in the Low Cayman, and the BRAC is around three to four thousand. And from from five hundred or a couple hundred, yeah. amazing. But this one from about a thousand, twelve hundred fish yep. to you know eight, ten thousand. Yeah. And BRAC from less than five hundred to three or four thousand. It just gives me the biggest <laughs> grin on my face every time you say so, it. You know. And, the, the one in Grand is hard to assess because it's exposed, it's very deep. Right. And it's deeper than here. Yeah. I see. So harder to study. Harder to study. You have to do tech diving to really do that. You have to have like a rebreather. And, yeah. Yeah. It's but, you know, data that we, the little data we have on it from a few years ago, you know, it was maybe a hundred fish or okay. so. But we know the population's in, increasing because there's a lot of the teenagers, if you want to call them, you know, they. Yeah, big. So you're seeing more teenagers yeah. out there on Grand. On Grand, yeah. That's um, amazing. And we're hoping next year to have an ROV. What's an it, ROV? Um, it's, it's like, like a, a little, a little uh, camera yeah. with a motor on it. Yeah. And tethered. Like a remote control. Yeah. It's, um, remote operated vehicle. Remote yeah, operated, operated vehicle. vehicle. But the, you know, you. it's just, it has a camera on it and it's tethered to like a computer up at the top. Okay. And we've tried it over the years. But the, the trouble we always had with it, but the current was so strong, even with 300, 100 meters of line on it, you know, the bend into it did not allow it, and the motors were not powerful yeah. enough to keep up in the current. So we got to sort of get a commercial grade one to, to have that capacity, and we're hoping for it in the next year. That's exciting. So next year, you're going to want to tune in for that. So we're saying t maybe about 10,000 here, three, Ten. three or four over on BRAC, yeah. several hundred on, on Grand. Yeah, so if you do the numbers on that, it's about 15,000, but that's not counting the juveniles that don't. That don't go out. That's no. just the adults, yeah, the ones that we can't. It's, yeah. the, it's the reproductive population that I gathers see. at these sites. So there's actually more than that. There's actually more. Wow. So if you put that together and just take a guesstimate, there's yeah. at least another, it's a 50 50, yeah. half of the reproductive population. The half is still out there. Wow, um, so it might so yeah, actually even be double that number. Yeah. Wonderful. All right, you guys, that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you, Dr. Croy McCoy. Thank you, Janelle, for joining us. And thank you, Ms. Gale's class, for your wonderful question. Um, uh, oh, there was one other question, approximately how many eggs does each grouper lay? And I can field that one. Um, it depends on how, on how old the Nassau is, on how big and old the female is. The bigger they are, the more that they, they, the more gametes they, they release. And I think the biggest ones will release several million eggs each year when they go out to the, <clears throat> to the grouper site. Is that correct? Yeah. And, uh, you know, groupers are not like, uh, humans you know they the large they always produce no matter what you know? right so there's not a time frame as they get old that they stop right they're until they're until the end wow so that it is it's very important the uh protect females yeah. and the large males to yeah. have that capacity to exactly. keep reproducing because 
we've proven with science that we do here mm -hmm. that the larger females produce better quality eggs. And right. So as far as um, so survivorship, we want to we, we, we really want to protect them. Yeah, that's that's why we have in the open season a slot size. You know, we don't. So that means like when you can fish, there's certain yeah. sizes of fish that you can fish, and you can't catch them outside of those sizes. No. So the really big ones, they're, you're saying no, no, and because those are the most important for reproduction. Yeah, and then you have the smaller size classes. So, you know, you don't want to take the young, and you don't want to take the old. You take the the ones in the middle, which is um, 16 to 24 inches. Right. You know, I guess you'd call them the teenagers. The teenagers. Yeah. Yeah. So hmm. take some of those. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Wonderful question. I want to thank you all for being here. It was great to see you. Remember to check out the Grouper Moon education blog. I'm posting videos behind the scene. Uh, photographs and interviews there every day and you guys are going to want to be sure to join us on thursday at the same time 10 30 we're going to go for a dive we're going to go underwater we're going to take you underwater from your classroom and you're going to see one of the famous dave's dive sites out here on little cayman um, thanks again for everyone being out here thank you to all the classrooms that showed up i want to thank all everyone from doe and reef for all of their help and we'll see you next time go grouper moon bye everybody bye yeah <laughs> all right till thursday bye you guys <laughs>